Quantum Rabbit, a Franken Sound podcast. Hello, thanks for tuning in. Firstly, this episode does have the potential to offend some people, and I probably should call straight away a severe language warning. I wanted to talk about a few experiences I've had working in the theatre. I enlisted the help of some anonymous external parties for this story. Not everyone was comfortable hearing their voice opinionating on these matters, so we ended up mixing things up and reenacting some of the live conversations that we had. The following stories are all true, minus a 10 to 15 percent exaggeration or bad memory factor. Names have been omitted, mostly. Uh, apologies, Tim Winton. Let's dive in. Episode 7. Working in the theatre. In high school, briefly, I studied theatre. It was an enjoyable class. It was one subject which didn't seem like work. Largely because it wasn't. Twenty years later, I occasionally found myself working in the theatre. It's a place strange enough to lose yourself in and forget that what you're doing isn't really very important. That's part of the appeal. Let's imagine for a moment. You're in a dark room surrounded by artists of every kind. Sympathetic souls. Designers. Musicians. Performers. It's like a different society running in parallel to the outside world. With its own structure and hierarchy. Essentially it's another dimension. Connected to the real world by a series of ideas, the potential for ritual and, of course, magic. Outside the four walls of the theatre, how strange it would be to lay with one's head on the lap of a co-worker who is gently stroking your hair, while the company director outlines the plan for the afternoon. Artists live here. Oh, yeah. It's just the playground of the privileged, dude. It's the artistic playground of the fucking privileged. Poor people don't go to it. And I don't care that Shakespeare did it with people in the roundhouse and it was their home and away. You know what I mean? Who cares? I'd say that normal people don't go to the theatre. It's for privileged people, dude. It always has been. In Australia, anyway. But you've been to good theatre as well. No. No, I haven't. When I look back and think about the theatre that I've been to... Well, I can think of at least one show you've been to... That that I've enjoyed? Yeah. Remind me. The aircraft crash one? No, I never went to that. I thought you went to it. I would like to have gone to it, but I never did. That was great. You would have loved that. I really wanted to see that. I would have really liked it, but I never went. In the mind of most people, public speaking is their biggest fear. Yet actors do it all the time. Does that make them some of the bravest people on the planet? The actor needs to be both sensitive and strong, confident and vulnerable because few professions have such a sustained level of rejection built into the job description. Actors often need to memorise pages of information and recite it convincingly to a highly critical audience. If performing the craft at a high level, it can also be dangerous to confuse an adopted persona with your own identity especially if you're channeling. Imagine, for instance, having to play the part of a pedophile. Picture a theatre show that runs for six weeks, 
travelling to local primary schools as part of an educational safety program. The actor plays the part of an online predator, grooming his teenage prey through a series of compliments, put-downs and misdirections, before revealing himself in the play to be truly evil. During rehearsal days, the actor takes lunch outside. The theatre is next to a park with a small, empty playground. He sits on a swing and takes a number of bites into his sandwich. After which he looks up and discovers the nearby school is releasing children into the park for their lunch break. As they run towards him, our pretend predator's level of discomfort grows and he feels sickened by his thoughts, which he perceives as not belonging to him, but to the character he's been living inside of all morning. Regardless, the next day, he eats lunch inside. Like that Winton one you worked on, the, the Melbourne uh, one. The turning. The turning. And it's like a 15-year-old bogan in Albany, and she's like... And the wind flutters across like the breeze of a hundred saviours. Bogan chicks don't talk like that. He knows that, the cunt. But... I remember the director in that show at one point asked the cast they were doing a recording, can anybody do an Aboriginal accent? No. <laughs> Under what other situation is it okay to say that? <laughs> Once in the theatre, I was involved in a show in which the writer and the director couldn't agree on many aspects of the play. They were unable to reconcile their differences to the point where, on opening night, at the writer's request, a note was placed on each and every seat of the 250-seat theatre. The note read, quote, I would like to acknowledge the people who bravely shared their stories and the actors and creative artists who contributed to this work in good faith. However, the outcome of this production does not reflect my original scripted or communicated intentions as the playwright. It was an extraordinary show of defiance by the writer. Essentially a very public vote of no confidence in the director of the company. The controversy would have inevitably helped sell a few more tickets, but not quite enough. The show's run was cut short. There must have been something, some piece Privileged of theatre somewhere. No, no that... none, none. And I tricked myself when I was working on it. I was thinking like, wow, this is kind of cool. But when I look back now, it was shit. And no one goes to it. Who do I talk to? Oh, I went to the theatre the other night. Nobody do. Nobody goes to it. No one goes actively, like, bought tickets. They get free ones and shit, but they don't actively go to it. I once had the opportunity to work on a show in which some set designers had been flown in from the East. I privately thought of them as the master and his apprentice. The production manager simply referred to them as arse clowns. They were a little bit needy, and they hadn't really done their prep. My first meeting was with the apprentice. He opened his MacBook, and as the soft blue light flashed upon the screen, it revealed the perfect silhouette of a single pubic hair. I can still picture how symmetrically it sat in the centre of the monitor. He brushed it away, and we both said nothing. I'm constantly aware that there's people pretending to be other people on the stage. And I've never seen an actor in a play, and I've thought, this is really touching, this bit. I don't think that at all. I think this is a grown man running around pretending to be someone. That's what I think when I'm in the room. I do not connect at all. It was a late night in the theatre, Nothing had been going to plan all day. The set was in disarray. Lights hadn't been installed where they were needed, and not much could be done about it with actors still rehearsing on stage. But eventually, the actors went home, and it was time to plot through scenes one by one. 
pointing lights and focusing them. But the lighting designer was about to have a meltdown. It was as if 30 years of frustration suddenly condensed into a realisation that it was always like this in the theatre. Sets were never built on time. Lights were never in the right place. Software was always glitching. And it was all for nothing. He stopped what he was doing. I've had enough of this. He leaned back and pushed a bunch of papers off the desk. I'm just tired of it, actually. He stood up. I'm fucking sick of it, guys. A previously quiet space suddenly got even quieter. And he spoke his piece. I'm going to tell you, this fucking industry is a pile of shit. You just work and work and it never changes. Nobody gets paid for the time they put in and they just expect you to go along with it. I've had enough. I'm fucking sick of it. The crew convinced him to go back to the hotel and get some sleep. But all I could think was, well, he's right. But he'll be back tomorrow. Working. In the theatre.